we can intentionally bring things into our corporate culture that will cultivate, that will help nourish and nurture those things we want to grow. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudoua, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Chief Marketing Officer. Our goal is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. So, Andrew, welcome to June 2021. Well, that means we are almost halfway through the year. It's true. It also means that we are a year and a couple months past the announcement that we had a global pandemic. And a lot of the schools shut down. And, of course, we at IEW did just about everything we could do to, that we could think of to help school teachers help their students who are now going to be sent home, to help these parents who were now suddenly accidental homeschoolers. And you and I did a webinar together. Actually, it was mostly you, I'm sure, (laughs) called Culture, Curriculum, and Care. And kind of the theme was, how do you create a good culture? What kind of curriculum do you use? And what type of care can you provide now that you're doing this homeschooling thing whether you're a teacher helping parents or, you know, you remember that whole thing. And we'll put a link yeah. to the recording of that in our show notes. And I've done that talk at several conferences, both online and actually mm-hmm. live. Right. And uh, people have been, you know, very, very grateful mm-hmm. for the perspectives. Right, right. So that's what we're going to talk about today. That is what we're going to talk about today. And I think just to kind of preface it a little bit, uh, we're going to do this as a two-parter. I don't know where we're exactly going to do the break, but, you know, you're a professional talker and usually (laughs) have a difficult time getting a lot of content into a very short amount of time summarizing. If I was a professional talker, I could compress a lot of content into a short (laughs) amount of time. So I must be borderline professional (laughs) talker. But, yeah, it's a big subject. Any of those ideas could be unpacked and unpacked and continually. Yes, yes. Yes. Re-unpacked. Yes. And while IEW does have a great contingency of great parents who have chosen the pathway of home education, we also have a lot of teachers and parents who are choosing other paths. So I, I just wanted to preface this by saying we are speaking primarily to teachers, whether you're home teachers or teachers in a classroom, of how you can create an appropriate culture, curriculum, and care in your classroom. Mm -hmm. Lots of C's there, Andrew. (laughs) C seems to be the letter that lends itself most easily to alliteration. Right. But, you know, culture is something I've been talking about for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I've come to love the word more and more. You know, there's some words you just hate. You just instinctively like, Bleh, like summarize. Mm-hmm. It's like nobody gets a happy face when mm-hmm. they hear that word. But culture has kind of grown on me as I've explored the definitions. Well, did you did culture at first kind of have a negative effect on you? Well, I didn't feel very connected mm. with the word because the first definition of the three that I mention is kind of beyond my control or influence. You know, Mm -hmm. when you say culture, Mm -hmm. and and sometimes it has a modifier, American culture or youth culture or European culture or, you know, whatever Mm -hmm. people say, they generally mean that's the stuff of life. That's the books and the movies and the Mm -hmm. music and the architecture and the art and the poetry and the, the... cuisine, the Mm -hmm. fashion, you know, all of the stuff that we bump into as we go about living in our 21st century Mm -hmm. lives. And we get perspective on that when we compare it 
with a different place or a different time. Got it. Mm -hmm. But really, I, I think the frustrating part is we don't have much ability to affect it or control it or change it. I can't, I can't stop bad movies. Mm -hmm. I can't eliminate music that's distasteful. Mm -hmm. I can't prevent a bad book from being published. I, I have no power. Mm -hmm. So you feel kind of powerless mm -hmm. when you're up against that big world of the culture. And, and so I think, you know, that's kind of frustrating. But if we unpack the word itself a little more, then we notice that there are some other definitions. Uh, one you've heard me use, you've used, corporate culture. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so that's different in that it's defining kind of the way we do things around here. Mm -hmm. And you actually have a lot of input of our corporate culture here at IEW. <laughs> well, and, and you do. We all do. Mm -hmm. I mean, we but we we think, OK, what policies or suggestions yeah. or schedules or procedures or environmental things can we adjust to make this the best possible company it can be. Right. So that's the corporate culture, but it extends beyond a business. Uh, churches mm -hmm. might have a corporate culture, the way we do stuff around here. Mm -hmm. Schools mm -hmm. try to establish a corporate culture. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, I've been in schools where there are some, you know, very inspiring things on the walls, you know, artwork or posters, mm -hmm. quotations. Obviously, the school is trying to do something to make that a better school environmentally. There may be procedures or habits or schedules that are instituted to make it a better school. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, families have a corporate culture. Yes. The way we do stuff around here. <laughs> yes. And and that that we do have a lot of control mm -hmm. over our corporate culture. Do and you know that my mother told me that I was too strict on my boys? Too strict. So you know what the answer is? I'm super lenient with their children. Yes. <laughs> well, I did hear a saying once that if you're strict with your children, you can spoil your grandchildren. Yes, good. But if you spoil your children, you'll have to raise your grandchildren. Oh, dear. Okay. <laughs> and obviously, that's kind of an extreme thought. But, yep. but there is that generational culture yeah. that gets passed on. Sure. And I'm sure that all of your boys, when they become parents, as one of them is already, mm -hmm. uh, there will be a strictness that they inherited from you that mm -hmm. will benefit your grandchildren. So you can spoil them. And yep. Show up and lavish them with love and gifts and yep. let them do whatever they want <laughs> and then leave quickly before the consequences are known. Uh, but so we kind of look at that corporate culture as, you know, things that we intentionally do because we have control. And to the degree that we intentionally do that, we also end up filtering the greater culture. So... You know, a family, for example, while, uh, you know, parents in a family can't prevent bad music, bad movies, and bad books from existing, they can filter the books and the music and the movies and the influences that come into the home mm -hmm. to some degree. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's part of the, the job. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the talks that we did a long, long, long time ago, had the title, What Are We Really Doing Here? Mm -hmm. And that's a great question for everyone to ask as a teacher in a classroom. Mm -hmm. What am I really doing here right. as a parent in a home, homeschooling or not? What am I really doing here? Because that brings an intentionality that then helps everyone. It helps to create a vision. It helps to create a shared mission. And oftentimes... The appearance is I'm administering curriculum or I am supervising children or I am responsible to teach them basic skills, whether it's a classroom or a home. That's the appearance. But inside of that, what are you really doing? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a harder question. But I would argue 
the more important question. Indeed. So that's two different definitions of culture. Is there a third definition? The third one is the part that makes makes it all make sense to okay. me. And it's it's kind of one of those duh moments. Okay. <laughs> People use words but don't necessarily recognize the meaning hmm. or the full meaning or the nuance of a word. Okay. But culture in the third definition would be the the petri dish. The mm. the little round dish of yellow jello that mm-hmm. you get when you are in eighth grade science or high school biology or mm-hmm. something. Mm-hmm. We call that a culture. Hmm. Yep. And why do we call it a culture? Because we're supposed to grow something in that little yellow dish Goo. of jello. <laughs> um, we put something in, some mm-hmm. bacteria or something. Mm-hmm. And then if the culture is good, that grows. If the culture is not good, if it's toxic or antiseptic, then what you're trying to grow won't grow. Mm. So then you think, aha, so the purpose of culture is to grow something. But it's pretty obvious. It's right there in the word cultivate. Oh. Right? Oh, yes. I mean, if you're trying to cultivate, you're trying to grow Mm -hmm. something. Right. So the big question is how does the culture that you – create or live in or are surrounded by grow or fail to grow what you are trying to grow. Right. So when we think about the larger culture, right, American culture, it seems to have lost its purpose to grow something Hmm. specific. Hmm. It just exists. It just is. Whereas I would argue that smaller cultures corporate cultures, domestic cultures, um, maybe some historical cultures, there was a vision, there was a purpose, and the idea was to grow a particular thing, whatever that is. So you would look at the purpose of the organization. In the military, there's a culture, and and it's still pretty intact, I think, for the most part. Mm -hmm. At least I have a few of my ex-students who've gone through Marine Corps boot camp. Oh, wow and have described to some degree the culture. And what is it trying to grow? It's trying to grow strength and fortitude and discipline and an understanding of hierarchy and obedience and a willingness to be really, really uncomfortable or even suffer pain for a greater good. Mm -hmm. And so we think, okay, that's an appropriate thing to try to grow Mm -hmm. because what you want is really tough people Mm -hmm. who will be ready to protect you should the need occur. You look at, you know, a business. We're we're trying to grow what? We're trying to instill vision. We're trying to create an environment where people uh, can be at least happy, if not joyful, working together. Right. We try to be uh, very welcoming, right? And so those are some priorities. We're trying to grow those things by the environment, the policies, the practices. Even even like here at IEW, one of the things that you've instituted was this kind of professional development idea where how can we as employees do things that would help us grow in our skills so that we can become better at who we are in either in our roles or just as a whole person. Mm-hmm. So I love that. And, and of course, shared culture gives people points of contact for relationship and community. Mm-hmm. An example of that that's kind of self-evident, but a lot of families don't take advantage of it, is reading the same book yeah, or reading a book together. Mm-hmm. We have our our book of the month we offer everyone. We don't Here at IEW. require yeah. them. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, it's interesting. If we're all reading the same book, mm-hmm. we can talk about that. We can unpack ideas. We can talk about how that book made us think about something else mm-hmm. in our life or our mm-hmm. world or mm-hmm. our relationships or the problems we're dealing with. If you read a book, mm-hmm. preferably aloud mm-hmm. to your whole family, mm-hmm. then as you live your life together, there's shared knowledge of that book or 
that experience the characters had or that circumstance or condition or that humor. Mm -hmm. And you can relate back and forth Mm -hmm. from lived experience to um, literary experience. And that brings more integration and joy to to the family. Same thing with a classroom. If if a whole group of kids has read the book together or mm-hmm. or even, say, memorized a, a great poem together. I remember I was in one school and the whole fifth grade class had memorized the entire version of Paul Revere's ride. Oh, nice. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they were so enthusiastic about mm-hmm. it and recited it for mm-hmm. me as a guest. But more more than that is they all had kind of that that same delicious – sensory, intellectual feast that they could share about with each other and with and with others outside their group. So we can intentionally bring things into our corporate culture that will cultivate, that will grow, that will help nourish and nurture those things we want to grow. Right. I I would be remiss if I did not mention here your talk, Nurturing Competent Communicators, and how you talk about the value of reading out loud to children of all ages, you know, all the way down, you know, high school all the way down. And then, of course, the value of memorized language, specifically poetry. And I, I love what you just shared. It made me think of the time that you read to us A Christmas Carol. Uh-huh. at our IEW Christmas party one year and just how sweet that was. I, I, and you, we ha- ask you to do that occasionally uh, with other Christmas stories that are just really I'm pretty mean. sure I didn't read the whole book, but a chunk of it, I suspect. Yeah, I guess if I went back and thought about the thing, the stories that we had you read at Christmas time, it probably wasn't the whole Christmas Carol, but there were other stories that you've read to us out loud that were very and, sweet. You know, I, I approach that topic. I've been given that talk over 20 years. Mm-hmm. And I say, if what you want is a child who will grow up to be an excellent writer and speaker of English language 20 years from now, this is what you do. Right. But now I've been out, you know, I'm back on the convention circuit a mm-hmm. little bit mm-hmm. and you know, every time I'm out there, I meet people who will say something like, I heard your talk 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. It changed my family. Mm. It changed our life. Right. And they will usually go on to say not how reading aloud improved the kids' communication skills, which for me is just kind of a given, mm-hmm. but more how it enriched them all as a family. Oh, nice. Mm-hmm. And so – and when you think about growing stuff, I, I am not – Big into gardening. Um, <laughs> anyone who knows me knows that your wife is. I, but I you're actually not. complain about small gardening chores, <laughs> like moving a wheelbarrow full of dirt or mulching ten bags of leaves. Um, but I have observed her. And what do you do when you want to grow something? Well, you prepare mm-hmm. properly the soil. You prepare the holes you're going to put the things in. You select the things that you're going to plant for a purpose. Mm -hmm. You don't just randomly plant stuff around. And if you're really scientific, you can get into knowing which flowers repel the insects that might attack which plants. And you you do your four sisters' vegetables together. And there's all sorts of science between about that, which she knows. I don't know. (laughs) Um, She I. I don't even know what the four sisters are, but it's like corn, beans, something else. I'm sure half our listeners. I was just going to say, and those listeners at home are have told you the other two, and I have. But you select what you're going to grow, Mm -hmm. and then you have to continue. You have to be sure those plants have sufficient water and sunlight. Mm -hmm. You have to be sure that they are not choked by weeds or other plants. You often have to defend those things from pests, insects, rodents that would try to destroy. Well, same thing in the home, same Mm -hmm. thing in the classroom. If you want to cultivate a joy of poetry among the students in your classroom, you have to actively do that Mm -hmm. until, well, forever pretty Mm -hmm. much, until (laughs) they leave your control. Right. Because even after you eat the fruits and vegetables from your garden and things go dormant, you still have to be aware that next year you want to 
bring this back to life and do it again mm -hmm. and prepare mm -hmm. accordingly. So there's mm -hmm. that tending idea mm -hmm. to culture that you know we kind of take for granted in in agriculture, agriculture. <laughs> <laughs> nice, <laughs> but we we don't necessarily think of so consciously mm -hmm. in teaching and raising children. Right, right. Do you know, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Stephen Covey's principles, seven habits. Yeah. Well, one of his habits is um, sharpen the saw. Mm -hmm. And I once heard a talk about this, only it was sharpen the hoe. And do you know, I don't know this, my dad was a gardener, and but if your hoe is sharp, you're able to weed your garden much more easily. Mm. So if you sharpen your hoe, you're able to get through those rows much faster. And that idea that Stephen Covey preaches, if I can use that word, is take some time to develop in yourself uh, skills so that you can be a better teacher. Well, and it makes me think of tools in general, mm -hmm. right? I mean, anyone who's constructing anything, whether mm -hmm. it's a garden or a, you know, a tree house, right? Uh, you have the tools. And if your tools are in good condition, mm -hmm. if they are the right tools, Everything goes better. So the sharper hoe, the right kind of spade, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and to some degree, I think that's our business mm -hmm. is we are creating and providing and educating people how to use what we believe are the best tools to cultivate a love of language, mm -hmm. a love of poetry and literature, a love of – uh, creativity and composition. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we're very proud of the tools yes. that we offer yes. in that regard. And so that kind of moves us into the whole idea of curriculum because mm -hmm. you think, okay, sounds like, you know, the books you read and the writing program you use and the the syllabus of poetry or literature, that's that gets us into the more concrete world of what shall I do? Right, right. So first is what do I want to do? What am I really trying to do? And then what shall I use to accomplish that? Right. And when we were speaking to the accidental homeschoolers, you <laughs> honed the curriculum choices down to basically two, arts and sciences. Well, that's not me. That's classical education. Okay. You know. <laughs> well, in this talk that we did together, yes. you said – in curriculum, you basically need to address arts and sciences. Right. Well, the arts are things you do. Mm -hmm. You learn them by doing them. Mm -hmm. And the sciences are things that you know. You learn them by basically memory. Oh, okay. So when I do an experiment in chemistry, I'm actually doing an art, not a science? Well, it's kind of a, a mix of that. Okay. Um, one thing is you wouldn't know what to do in an experiment unless you had a plan. True. So you know the plan so you can do the experiment. But when you think of arts, we're thinking of things that anyone can learn, but there's, there's a pathway. Mm -hmm. okay. So drawing, mm -hmm. painting, um, two pathways that I have never stepped upon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so I'm miserably bad at drawing or painting. Sculpture would be even worse. Uh, music, I have a little more experience. Anyone can learn to play a musical instrument. Anyone can learn to draw, Andrew. Uh, I, I do believe that intellectually. <laughs> it just doesn't live in my heart. Uh, but then that would also extend to writing, mm -hmm. sports. Mm -hmm. Th those are things that require some knowledge, mm -hmm. but they cannot be learned only by knowledge. Mm -hmm. you, you can't just watch a video and pick up a violin and play it. Right, 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 exactly. There are things that you can know that help you write better, but you won't write better unless you do those things and they become easier and easier and easier and mm -hmm. easier and you get that mastery going. Mm -hmm. You know, math is kind of in the middle. You have to know certain things, but that's not enough. You have to do it enough that you start to be able to do it more quickly, more easily, see applications. You start to think mathematically. Mm -hmm. And then other things are much more kind of in the sciences realm in terms of history, right? I mean, 
you learn names and dates and causes and effects and relationships and um, echoes through time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of that you, you learn because you read or hear and then you contemplate and think about. And, and not until probably a much higher level does it become the skill of doing history. So there's always going to be that those types of things where you need the knowledge to learn the skill. Mm. Or once you have enough knowledge, you can do a skill like a scientific experiment without the manual of what to do first, second, third, fourth, fifth. So, you know, those are the two areas. But I, I would back up just a little bit and think about the word curriculum. Okay. So it comes from the Latin uh, curus meaning run or curriculum, essentially meaning racetrack. Okay. Right. And there's there's two kinds of marathons, right? There's the original marathon idea where you start in one place and then you run 26 miles or so and you end in a different place. Okay, right. So you go from here to there. You're making progress through time and space. Mm -hmm. And then there's the kind of race where you go around a racetrack again and again and again and again. Right. This would be epitomized by, I read about this once, a thing that uh, I believe still exists, but it did for many years if it doesn't, called the Self-Transcendence Marathon. Oh. It was uh, created by a guy named Sri Chinmoy. Hmm. And this was a 3,100-mile race. Oh, my word. And you essentially run around a, a couple few blocks in Queens, New York. Uh-huh. You make 5,649 laps. Oh, my word. Around this several-block place in Queens, New York. You are allowed to run from 6 a.m. to midnight, and you have to finish within 52 days. Okay. And if you complete this, you get a T-shirt. Okay. (laughs) Now, I'm sure there is some self-transcendent value Mm -hmm. in accomplishing something like this. So I'm not not saying, you know, it's stupid or anything. Right, right. But we could juxtapose that against, say, climbing a mountain. Now, when we choose curriculum— we kind of have a choice. Do we want to be on a track where we just go around and do the same thing again and again and again and again? And, and then only those who have extraordinary capacity to deal with that level of tedium will succeed. Mm-hmm. Or would we have better success starting along a pathway and passing by some lakes and through a forest mm-hmm. and reaching mm-hmm. up to the timber line and then, mm-hmm. you know, finishing at the top of the mountain where we have a beautiful view. We mm-hmm. have a poetic enrichment. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think we want to look at those as maybe metaphors okay. for the curriculum that we choose. Mm-hmm. Are we getting a pile of books with a number on the cover and we kind of just keep doing the same thing again and again year after year and... It's a little different because we're older, but the process is the same kind of tedium, which is mostly by memory of school, more or less. Uh, Or could we say we want to have an objective to reach through, you know, a good and true and beautiful path? And then what's the difference and how do we pursue that? Right. I learned something the other day about my daughter-in-law, which... She and I are very much alike. When we go for walks, Mm -hmm. because she's a walker now, too. You see, she married my son. Right, so she's got to. (laughs) We don't like to go past the same place twice. So it always has to be a circuitous route. route. Right. It's like, I've already seen that house. I want to go a different way so I I can see another house. But I think about our writing method, and I like to equate it to this idea of going up a hill, So you're starting at the bottom of a mountain, Mm -hmm. and you're going up a hill, but because the hill could be arduous and steep, you need to do what's called switchbacks. Mm -hmm. So we actually climbed um, one of the hills at Yosemite where there were switchbacks, and we just had to – in some ways it seemed like we were going the same path over and over again, but we weren't because Mm -hmm. we were going higher and higher. Yes. And finally at the top, we're at Glacier Point, and it was a beautiful view. Yeah. That's a a perfect analogy to the repetition that Mm -hmm. is necessary to reach the goal, but not 
tedious in the same way mm -hmm. as just running laps around a football field or yep. something. Yeah. We have gotten the signal from our timer that we are out of time, but you have left out the care part of this talk. So let's not wait too long because I don't want our listeners to feel like we don't care for them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they'll think that. Okay, good. So we'll talk again next week then. All right. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, you can subscribe to this podcast in iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcast. Until then, on behalf of Andrew Pudua and the team at IEW, I thank you for allowing us to partner with you on your journey toward better listening, speaking, reading, writing, and thinking. <laughs>